real joy to be here. Um, is this on? We good? We, um, we have a special place in our heart for this congregation and for this church. You came and partnered with us at a very crucial time for us as we were uh, endeavoring in, in many new ministries, and uh, it was such a sweet uh, time for us, and our kids were younger then, our kids are now older, but uh, they, uh, they actually were saying um, uh, that they almost wanted to come today, they weren't able to come, but they wanted to come, and they said, we want to go to the Spiderweb Church because uh, of the playground that has a big net that when they were kids thought they looked like a big spider web, and of course they grew up in Africa, so um, it reminded them of home, but... Uh, <laughs> What a joy to be back here with you all. Uh, I'm going to be kicking off the, shep- the, the Shepherds Conference, the, the, mystery, the Missions Conference, the Missions Conference for this church this week. And the theme of this conference is the centrality of the local church in missions. And the passage I'd like you to turn with me, which will be our main passage for this morning, is Ephesians 3 verses 1 through 13, and I'm going to go ahead and begin by reading Ephesians 3 from verse 1 all the way down to verse 13. Ephesians 3, 1 says this, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. Let's pray. Again, Father, we come to you briefly just to ask you to help us to understand your word better, that we might be able to apply it to our lives, ultimately for your name's sake, for your glory. Do the work that you alone can do. Tune our hearts and minds to hear your truth, that we might not only live it out, but reach out to a world that desperately needs you, that does not know you. We thank you for the fellowship that we have in Christ, those who are in you. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, in one respect, when I think about the theme uh, that was given to me to speak on the centrality of the local church in missions, it's almost sad that we have to make that a theme because really anyone who reads the Bible should realize that the church is the very heartbeat of missions and missions is the very heartbeat of the church. They are inextricably joined together in the New Testament, and it's hard to think about missions without the church. 
The Great Commission in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, says that we are to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them all that has been commanded. And if you were to go to any country and ask anyone in that country, I'm looking for a place where I can find the teaching of Jesus Christ and a place where I might be baptized, where might I find that? Lord willing, they would point you to a church. If there's a church in that country, that's, what we, that's the place that would be doing both of those things. It's like God designed a place exactly for his commission. We have the church. It's hard to think of the Great Commission without the church. Throughout the centuries since the time of Christ, everywhere the gospel has gone, the local church has been established. You read through the book of Acts, in all the missionary journeys, in every city they visited, they established churches. And in the ones where churches were not yet established, they wrote letters to or went back and visited to help establish churches. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus declared to Peter, I will build my church and the greats, uh, gates of Hades will not prevail against it. But recently, in recent years, in recent decades, we have seen a movement in missions whereby there has been an unattachment, a disenfranchisement between the church and missions. All of a sudden, missions has become this thing that's out there that's not necessarily involving local churches that are sending, nor is it involving local churches on the foreign field which is sort of an oxymoron because a missionary literally comes from the word sent one, mito in the Greek, in the, in, the, in the Latin related to apostello in the Greek, which is to send, a sent one. And if you're a missionary and you're not sent by anyone and you're not going to anyone or to a church, what, what is your mission? In a recent survey in 2015 given to more than 100 missionaries in Central Africa, 62% of missionaries that were surveyed indicated that their primary role in missions was related to social action, teaching school children, medical mission work, youth work, support staff, etc. Only 37% of missionaries in this survey were involved in traditional missionary work, that is, pastoring, pastoring evangelism, teaching the Bible. Strengthening churches. The church strengthening, church planting would be traditional missionary work. Now, there's nothing wrong with teaching children, and there's nothing wrong with reaching out with medical care. We rejoice when we see those who are suffering cared for. That's the heart of the church, really, is to see those who are cared for. But first and foremost, it must be spiritually. And if they do know not the gospel, and they do not have a place where they can be taught the word then the cart becomes before the horse. In this survey, when asked about baptism, they were asked to answer this question. <clears throat> I baptize regularly, or I baptize, or I occasionally baptize people, or I often encourage people to be baptized, or I occasionally encourage people to be baptized, or lastly, I'm not typically involved at all with baptism. 47.5% of missionaries said, I'm typically not involved at all with baptism. Missionaries are not even encouraging people to be baptized. When asked about discipleship, the following questions were given, or they were asked the following question about discipleship and to identify themselves with one of four answers. Firstly, I am currently discipling one individual. Or, two, I am currently discipling somewhere between two and six people in a small group setting. Or, thirdly, I'm currently discipling a group of more than six people in a group setting. So, what was their relationship with discipleship? Fourthly, I am not currently discipling anyone. 31% of missionaries are not discipling anyone, according to this survey. Missionaries? Not making disciples? 32% of missionaries, 
This was shocking to me. 32% of missionaries in this survey indicated they were not involved in a particular local church on a regular basis. I think one of the reasons why missionaries have moved away from being involved in local churches is the role of mission agencies. Mission agencies have not been around forever. In fact, it wasn't until the late 1700s and early 1800s that they started to appear, and really the mid-1800s, that there began a big movement in missions with mission agencies, which were designed originally because they could help bring together funds and resources and teams of people from various small churches to go and help establish churches and Christian ministry in other churches countries. And in times past, it was essential to be associated with a missionary society or a missionary agency because you couldn't get a visa in many countries without actually having someone on the ground there for, to apply for you in advance. You needed to have addresses. You needed to have a sponsor. You needed to have all kinds of, uh, and then accountability. Uh, churches just couldn't fly back and forth and visit the missionaries enough, so they needed a mission a agency that could somehow keep people accountable, put out their prayer letters, do all kinds of service for them. But today, we're seeing a decline in missionaries sent out through organizations and an increase in missionaries being sent out by their own churches. And I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. In fact, I think in our lifetime, we may see the end of most missionary agencies. I think that it's very likely that in many of our lifetime, lifetimes we, we would see the end of this. Uh, and I think some of the reasons are sad and some of the reasons are good uh, or valid. Um, this, one of the sad reasons is because many of today's young missionaries don't want accountability. We have the GoFundMe missionary movement, the Choose Your Own Adventure missionary movement with very little accountability, the amateurization of missions. But we also have missionary organizations that have grown old and expensive, and many of them have become top-heavy with 10 to 20 percent of the funds raised going to administrative fees. And now you can apply for visas online to most every country around the world. In many countries, you don't need an established mission base. Accountability can be done. Many, many missionaries are monthly or even sometimes weekly. Zooming or Skyping or FaceTiming with the elders from their home churches. So we have this accountability and this relationship like never before. Church offices are now sometimes better equipped to support missionaries than even sending agencies now that post letters don't need to be sent out through the, through the mail services but could be going sent out electronically by the missionaries themselves. Even financial support can be managed sometimes even more efficiently in local churches and, and to add to that, with the current world agenda and trying to exclude anyone who doesn't accept the LGBTQ society and take away any privileges they have, I think that in our lifetime we'll see the tax-exempt status of organizations, Christian organizations, especially in starting with missionary organizations, and then eventually churches be taken away from ones that will not accept the world's agenda. And when that happens, I think a lot of uh, missionary agencies will be closing their doors. And, and, and some of them will survive. Some of them are, are so in tune with needs that are out there that churches don't have the ability to do on their own that they will need to survive. And other ones will not. But one thing we do know is that the church will survive because the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. It doesn't matter what gets thrown our way from whatever worldly power, the gates of Hades even will not prevail against the church. And our Lord is in absolute control and he knows what he is doing. And so as we think about the church this morning and the church's involvement in missions, I want to draw your attention to this passage which speaks about a mystery and I've entitled this message, The Mystery of Missions, because Paul reveals a mystery here that hadn't been revealed for thousands of years, one that was hinted at back in, with Abraham. And Paul says, now we know. 
I love watching mysteries. I, I don't know what it is about it. I like, I like seeing, wow, I can't believe how they figured that out, you know? And I'll be sitting there watching something. My wife will walk in the room and say, what are you watching? There'll be this some crime scene on the, on the TV. And what, what in the world are you? Oh, yeah, this guy just murdered his wife. And, you know, uh, they had no idea who did it, but they found one little hair from his beard uh, in the room, and he said he wasn't there. And so it's obviously him, you know? And she says, I like your beard. I think, I think you should keep it. That's, that's good. That's, uh, <laughs> looks good on you. Don't, don't ever shave that. You know, I, I just, you know, those aren't the kind of mysteries we're talking about here, but we're talking about a mystery, a biblical mystery, something that God has not yet revealed for a time. And in Scripture, we have different types of mysteries. Some mysteries or secrets will never be revealed because we don't need to know them. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. But there are other mysteries that God does reveal to his people. The term mystery is found 27 times in the New Testament. Most often it refers to something that was previously not understood in, in other generations, but now has been made clear, has been revealed. And that's the case here. The Old Testament in Genesis 12, 3, God told Abraham, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That was general. They could understand it. But how would they be blessed? It wasn't until Galatians 3.8 that the church fully understood it because Paul wrote, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. The scripture preached the gospel to Abraham, Paul says. Isaiah 49, 6, God said of Israel, I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation will reach to the ends of the earth. Most of the Jews didn't fully understand that. Most of them assumed that it meant God would use them as a light, that people would be drawn to them, convert to Judaism, become a, a Judaistic proselyte, and by then they could have salvation, the whole world could become Jewish. That was their understanding. But in Acts chapter 13, verse 47, Paul quoted Isaiah's prophecy and explained what it really meant. He said, for so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light and he doesn't say for all nations. He says, for all the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And in Ephesians 3, we have one of the best explanations of what this mystery of Christ is really about. And you know, before we actually get into this, I just want to point out the fact that when you solve a mystery, there is is usually some sort of sense of joy, satisfaction. I'm thinking about something even trivial. You know, I, I like Indian food. It's hard to find good Indian food that you don't have to pay for twice, you know, that, that you just can enjoy and not think about it again. But, but there, there, I found this place. It's a great Indian food restaurant, and I recommend it to my friends. And those who love Indian food say, I, it is wonderful. We love it. It's our favorite. And every time they told me, I get joy. I'm so excited. And they're like, I'm so glad you told me about that. I'm so glad you, you know. Even yesterday, uh, we th I had a, uh, a student from the Masters University phone me, a girl who's friends with our family, and she's come to us sometimes uh, asking advice about her car and stuff like that. She had problems. I said, why don't you try this mechanic? Because she got a quote, and it was hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and she didn't know what to do. I said, there's this other mechanic I know of. He's actually right across the street. Just call him. So later, she followed up. She told me what happened. She called him. She got the car towed across the street. They did it for less than half of what her original quote was. She was so excited. She had a, a, a problem, a mystery. She didn't know how to solve the problem with her car. And, you know, I found so much joy. I'm so glad that worked out. You know, you see how that joy is, but imagine, those are trivial things. So temporary, so fleeting. Imagine the joy that there is 
when you see your sin and you see a way of salvation and you repent and turn and trust in Christ and can share that with others and they come to you and say, I am so glad you spoke up. I am so glad you shared. And so as we look at this and we look about the mystery in missions, the mystery that is associated with the the church and the Jews and the Gentiles, I, I want you to just think about the fact that the, the, Paul's whole reason for writing this has to do with your, enjoy, your joy and your encouragement. If you think of the book of Ephesians as a whole, it's six chapters. You can divide it right down the middle. The first three are all motivation for you uh, to live holy lives. And chapter 4, verse 1 begins with the words... Therefore, I, the prison of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which you've been called. And chapters 4 through 6 include all these challenging passages on how you should live. And sometimes we as pastors turn you to chapters 4 and 6 and say, you see this? This is how you're supposed to live. But we forget to take you back to chapters 1 through 3 and say, this is the motivation. This is what brings the joy and, and encourages you to live this way. And that's what Paul is trying to accomplish when he gets stuck and thinks about this mystery. And so in chapter Chapter 3 of Ephesians, verses 1 through 13, we see three details about the mystery of Christ that really should encourage you to joyfully unite in a greater effort to be involved in the mission of the church. Three details about the mystery of Christ that should really bring you joy in missions. We're going to look at the revelation of the mystery, the reconciliation of the mystery, and the results of the mystery. And first of all, in verses 1 through 5, we have the revelation of the mystery. I'm just going to look at verse 1, first of all. It says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, dash. Do you see that dash? Does your Bible have that dash? Many Bibles have a dash right there. Some kind of comma or something like that. I think that's significant, and we'll see why. But first of all, let's back up. He says, for this reason. We say, well, for what reason, Paul? Well, he's just finished writing chapter 2, although he didn't call it chapter 2. Chapter 2 talks about all the truths that are related to Jews and Gentiles, going from chapter 2, verse 11, all the way down through verse 19. Chapters 2, verse 11 through 14, Christ has broken down the barrier between Jews and Gentiles. Chapter 2, verse 15, he's brought about unity and peace between Jews and Gentiles. Chapter 2, verse 16, he reconciles Jews and Gentiles to Christ as one body. Chapter 2, verse 19, Christ unites them into one household. I love it that you can only sit with your household. Chapter 2, verse 19 says, We are one household. But that's another sermon. (laughs) Because of this, for this reason, Paul wants to pray, and that's why the dash is there. Because Paul has just spoken about the church being united with Jews and Gentiles. He wants to pray for them, but he doesn't begin his, he begins his prayer in verse 1, and he carries on, he stops in the dash, and he carries on with it in verse 14. You can see that. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, Verse 14, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. That's where the prayer really gets picked up. So he has this parenthetical thought in here because he's so excited. He's just talked about the reason, that is, the Jews and Gentiles coming together, being united, reconciled as one body. And he's so excited about that, he wants to tell them and share with them, this is the mystery. This is the mystery. The Jews and Gentiles didn't get along. The Jews saw Gentiles as inferior, outcasts. David called Goliath an uncircumcised Philistine because circumcision was seen as a physical mark of being one of God's covenant people. And if you didn't have that physical mark, you were outside of the covenant of God. The New Testament times, we had two main territories where Jews lived. They lived up in the Galilee region, and they lived in the Judean region where Jerusalem was. And four times a year, those from Galilee needed to come down to the feasts. 
and right in between them was Samaria. And the most direct route was through Samaria, and many Jews would take it. Jesus took it. But some of the more pious Jews would not take it, and they would cross over the Jordan River and go on the east side of the Jordan and then cross back over and come in that way, take a longer route. Or they'd go down the coastal, by the coastal plains and come down and make it that way to Jerusalem. If they did go that way, for whatever reason, sometimes Jews would actually take their shoes off, their sandals off, after traveling through Samaria, a place where Gentiles had lived and inbred with Jews and made a Samaritan race that was full of all kinds of Gentile practices. They would take off their, their sandals and shake the dust off their sandals before coming into Judea. And God made the Jews a distinct people. The Jews were different than any other nation, and everybody knew it. They had a separate dietary system. They had clothing that was different, customs that were different. And God did that for a couple of reasons. One was that it, it was to be difficult for them to integrate with people of pagan societies. If you can't eat with pagans, it's hard to actually get close enough to become like them and start worshiping with them. But also so that other nations might look at them and say, why are they so, why did they do that? And ask them, why do you do that? Oh, because our God is holy and he wants to be worshiped in this way. And it was to point them towards their need to repent before the one and only true God. But for many of the Jews, they had allowed, allowed those differences to become a source of spiritual pride that separated them from Gentiles. In fact, instead of being a light to the Gentiles, they hated the Gentiles. They despised them. That's a big part of what's going on in the book of Jonah. Jonah runs away from Nineveh and he goes to Tarshish. Why? Because God wanted to have compassion on the people of Nineveh, and the people of Nineveh were Gentiles. And he couldn't handle the idea of God having compassion on people that were so undeserving as the Gentiles, as the Ninevites. Even in chapter 4 where compassion is mentioned twice and he cares more for the, the little tree than he did for children. God rebuked him for his lack of compassion So before Paul prays and praises God for, for uniting Jews and Gentiles into one household, knowing that that's a difficult concept for Jews and a confusing one for Gentiles, writing to the church in Ephesus, Ephesus, a pagan Gentile city that had Jews and Gentiles in the church, but a large Ju Gentile population, he paused to explain why this is so glorious, why this mystery is so amazing, and it begins with revelation. This revelation had captivated Paul, not only in his mind and in his passion, but literally he was held captive as a prisoner because of this mystery. Take a look at verse 1 again. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, verse 2, if you indeed have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you. Notice in verse 1, Paul doesn't describe himself as a prisoner of the Jews. The Jews are the one who had him arrested originally. He doesn't describe himself as a prisoner of Rome. The Romans were the ones who were keeping him incarcerated. He was writing this letter to them from a Roman prison. Rather, he says, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Who wanted to put Paul in jail more than anyone? It was the Jews. It was the Pharisees and Sadducees. Why? What upset them more than anything? Because Paul, who was a Jew, was saying that God wanted to reach out to the Gentiles and join Gentiles with Jews to make one body, one house. They hated Paul, and that's why he was in prison. He was in prison for the Gentiles, for the sake of the Gentiles. He's not trying to make them feel guilty about that. He's just reminding them indirectly of the animosity that the Jews had towards them, which has meted out on him, which is why he's in jail. 
which makes us understand why they'd feel so bad that he's in jail. He's in jail for preaching the gospel to people just like them. Paul viewed everything that had happened to him through the lens that God sovereignly called him to preach salvation to the Gentiles. He uses the word in verse 2, a steward of God's grace, a steward or a house manager, one who doesn't own the house, one who does not have uh, ownership of the possessions in the house, but is told to use the house and use the possessions in the way that the master of the house wants them used. And in this case... It's the grace of God of which he was a steward, and he's supposed to, do, to preach the grace of God to the Gentiles for you. So that revelation had really captivated him, but also the revelation is one that he wanted them to know they could understand. Look at verses 3 and 4. That by the revelation there was made to, known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief, by referring to this, when you read... You can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Paul emphasizes this mystery that he proclaims, this mystery for which he was imprisoned. It was not his own idea. He's not saying, this is not something I've come up with. I received this by revelation. And his intention was not only to preach the revelation, but to explain it so that they could understand it because understanding is essential for spiritual growth. And I just want to pause. I think it's significant that he really wants them to understand this mystery. You can tell someone that they need to forgive someone else. And that's instruction, and that's application. But unless you really give them the motivation behind it, before they understand what forgiveness is all about, and you take them to a place like Matthew chapter 18, where you have the parable of the the unmerciful servant, the servant who was given a, forgiven of a debt that he could never pay in his lifetime, and he goes and fell, finds his fellow servant and grabs him by the throat and chokes him and says, pay me back what you owe me, and it was three months' wages of a servant. And the other servant saw that and said, how could he be forgiven of so much and yet be so cruel and taxing upon his fellow servant he is an unmerciful servant. And that story was told so that you would see that those of you who've been forgiven of all your sins, that if you have repented of your sins and turned and trusted in Christ, that he has cleansed you, washed you wider than snow of all your sins, and today you are free. You are, you, you, from God's perspective, he sees you as holy, as righteous, when he looks at the film of your life, he doesn't see your life. He sees Christ's life. He says, another perfect life, just like my son, because your sins have been taken out of your account, according to Romans 4, and placed into Christ's account, where he paid for them fully on the cross, and his righteousness was taken out of his account and placed into your account so that your sin will never be seen. And as Romans 8 says, there is now therefore no condemnation for you who are in Jesus Christ. You will never be punished for your sins. Not the sins you committed in the past, not sins that are currently going on in your life, and not sins that you have yet to commit, which you don't even know about yet. They are all forgiven on the cross. You say, well, what motivates me to live a life of holiness? Because Jesus died on the cross for your sins. I told an illustration recently of, uh, in Africa, you've got uh, these, these roads that go through villages, dirt roads. Some villages, they've never seen a paved road. And occasionally, governments will put a paved road through a village, and the kids love it. Tar! It's hard! It's shiny! It's hot! It's black! Balls roll quickly on it! It's fun! Run! Let's play on the road! And while it's being built and before people really start using it, it's a really fun thing. But your parents tell you not to do it. Imagine if you're a young kid and your parents tell you not to play on the road, right? And so uh, would you maybe disobey? Yeah, I, I know I would. I know I did as a kid. Not in Africa, but I mean, you know, which one of us obeyed our parents all the time? Well, imagine one day you're playing on the road with your friends, you know you're not supposed to, and a truck comes along, and you don't see it, 
and it's about to hit you, but your neighbor sees it. He runs across the road, pushes you off the road, and he gets hit by the truck. It runs over his legs. Could have been a worse illustration. It runs over his legs, and he goes to the hospital. He loses his legs. You visit him. You're heartbroken. Would you play on the road the next day? No way. You're feeling the pain of somebody sacrificing themselves to help you, to save you. But let me ask you this. Three years go by. Your friends are out there. Hey, come out and play. Might you play on the road? So you've long forgotten this. Might you play on the road? You might. I would. But if that neighbor rolls out of his house in his wheelchair and waves to you and says, Hey, how are you today? Would you play on the road? Why? Grace. Grace, Titus 2.11 says, is our teacher. It teaches us to deny ungodliness. And Paul is trying to remind people of the grace of God. He is a steward of the grace of God. He wants them to understand that there's a mystery here, and the mystery involves Jews and Gentiles, and they can understand it. Not only can they understand it, but it's available for all. Take a look at verse 5. Which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. The heart of verse 5 is really related to time. In past generations, this was not known, but now the Spirit of God has revealed it to the apostles and prophets. The implication is here, I'm revealing it to you, verses 2 through 4. So now you can know this. There has been revelation. The mystery has been revealed. And then the second detail, not only do we see the revelation of the mystery, but secondly, we see the reconciliation of the mystery that this mystery involves reconciliation. The mystery involves Jews and Gentiles, but it involves reconciliation of them between one another and the, them as one body between them and God. Verse 6, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Even having already mentioned that the Jews look down on the Gentiles, I think it's Unlikely that we could really understand how difficult it would be for a Jew to fellowship with a Gentile in church. Even somebody who is saved, who's grown up their whole life. I mean, just imagine if you grew up in an environment where you were told that any foreigner would harm you and that you should never talk to any foreigner. I mean, imagine if you were told that every foreigner has a disease. And that if you came near them, it would affect your health. And there was, let's just say there were people among you. Let's say you were told that blonde people should be avoided at all costs. And I mean, just, you know, some sort of racist thought coming into your mind, uh, being, being twisted, something that God meant to preserve a certain people, and yet they took it and scorned and looked down on other people as though they were better. And you grew up in that again and again and again. And then you're told, they're one with you. You're one body. I, I don't think we can appreciate how difficult this would be. Take a look back with me at chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. This is where he explains this coming together, this reconciliation. Chapter 2, verse 14 of Ephesians. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might take the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Verse 16 is key and might reconcile them both into one body to God through the cross. Reconcil reconciling men both to God and each other. The word reconcile has this idea of former hostility, former brokenness, turning what used to be hostile into friendship. That's reconciliation. Some people say, well, I was never angry at God. I was never hostile towards God. You were. Scripture is clear. Prior to you coming to faith in Christ and being saved and repenting of your sin, you were a rebel against God. 
Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, he who is not with me is against me. James 4, 4 says, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, prior to coming to faith in Christ, you were a friend of the world. Romans 5.10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more have been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Colossians 1, 20 through 22, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And then it says, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. We were rebels. This is what we sing about. This morning we sang two songs. Uh, we sang three songs, but in two of them especially we had verses that spoke about our rebellion, our past rebellion against the holy God. In Christ alone we sang, scorned by the ones he came to save scorned we scorned him that's what we sang earlier scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied this is what we rejoice in his mercy is more remember that it starts out like this what love could remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all-knowing he counts not their sum thrown into the sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. This is what we rejoice in as believers. This is where our hope is. This is where peace is. The one who established peace in Ephesians 2.14, established peace in Ephesians 2.15, and preached peace. He gospeled peace in verse 17 of chapter 2 which gives us access to the Father. You think about the fact that we can pray to the Father, the fact that the veil has been torn in two, and that no longer it's just a priest who on one day of the year can go in and present offerings to the Father and seek forgiveness and atonement from the Father, but you can pray to the almighty God of creation because the veil has been ripped in two. And what Paul is getting at here about the mystery is that not only has the veil been ripped in two in the temple, but that outer court for the Gentiles and the inner court for the Jews, the walls have been fallen. The wall has fallen down between the two. That separation wall. There is no outer court and inner court. The church is the mystery. The church is one. Here we are. People who used to hate each other are together. And for the Jews, what that meant is ceremonial Judaism was dead. Dietary restrictions were dead. The, retire, the requirement of true followers to become Jews first, dead. Racial discrimination, dead. Segregation, dead. Anti-Semitism, dead. Strife between different groups in the church, dead. Loneliness in the church, dead. The most opposed two groups of people on the face of the planet were united. Any division you have in this church pales in comparison to division that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles prior to Christ. And if they can be united, you can be united. Amen. And imagine if I told you that the very people you grew up hating, that you would be fellow heirs, fellow members of the same body, fellow partakers of the promise with them. Take a look back at Ephesians 3.6 fellow heirs, believing Gentiles, have the same rights as believing Jews. Paul had declared in Ephesians 1.3, every believer has been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place, places in Christ. We have been blessed with everything that we need for life and godliness, Peter said. And so we have this immeasurable amount of blessing on the church to both Jews and Gentiles. That's the mystery, fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, he says. When God looks down from heaven, he doesn't say, oh, this is one, my, my one group, the Jews, and this is my other group, the Gentile or the church or the believer. He says, this is my church. That's the mystery. They didn't see that coming. 
1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were made to drink of one spirit. There's sort of a summarizing sentence here in Ephesians 1, 6. Fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Unity. Fellow partakers. As Galatians 3, 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. That's the mystery. The mystery is that outside of the church, there are people who hate each other. They are divided on all kinds of issues. And the world looks at the church and says, how is it that there are so much, there's so much peace? There's so much unity. And this is really where the missions comes in. Because when the church has peace and unity, missions happens naturally. Because other people are looking at it and saying, what is up with that place? Burbank is falling apart. But this church, unbelievable love and care for one another. Oh, how they love one another. It's unbelievable. How they're willing to forgive and move on and unite. had a situation on the mission field where uh, I was, we were trying to start a seminary, a pastoral training college, and uh, another missionary that I worked with, associated with, kind of not, not directly but work, but just associated with, he tried to sabotage what we were doing. Doctrinally, we didn't agree on certain issues having to do with eschatology. And so he got so wrapped up in that he tried to undo everything that I was doing to start that by going behind the scenes and spreading discord to people who were above me. And I never knew about that until he told me. And the reason he told me is because a couple years after all that happened, he got fired for another reason. And he went to another African country and was working in that country. And I happened to need to go to that country. And I, was, I went to the same city to do some studies there. And I saw him as I'm in that city. And we ran into each other. And I said, hey, how's it going? And we talked. And I said, you want to grab a meal? He said, sure. And he told me, I need to ask for your forgiveness because I was sowing discord and trying to undo. I got so wrapped up into what I thought was important that I missed it. He said, you and I agree on so much, we should have been best of friends. And I repent and I ask for your forgiveness. And I said, absolutely. I said, I had no idea you are doing that. I know it was tough. I had all kinds of you know, backlash from people who were trying to stop us. I didn't know you were involved. I didn't know the details you're telling me now. I didn't imagine you were happy about it, but, but, you know, he's saying I should have been happy about it. And in the course of our conversation, he had a problem. He had lots of his, his belongings still in storage up in, in the country we were in, in Malawi. And he didn't know what he was going to do, how he was going to go through it. And we were getting ready to go on furlough. I said, why don't you come up and stay in our house? And I'll have all your boxes delivered there. You can take as long as you want and sort through them. And we were getting ready to come back here. And I said, and whatever you want to take home, we'll ship it home for you in our container. And this guy goes up there and stays in our home. And other missionaries are saying, do the pita box know that you're in their house? <laughs> it was beautiful. There's no division. I have nothing but love for that man. And he's doing a good work. Well, we've seen the revelation of the mystery. We've seen reconciliation. And now we're going to get to really the results of the mystery. Verses 7 through 13. We'll move kind of quickly here. But the results of the mystery. There are four results. Proclamation, praise, prayer, and peace. Let's take a look at these four results of the mystery from verses 7 to 13. First of all, the proclamation, verses 7 through 9. 
he, Paul says, besides his passion for proclamation, we see a humility, and also he's really passive here. It's amazing. He says, of which I was made a minister. Just look at that. It's a weird construction. He doesn't say, I am a minister. I was made. This was forced upon me. I was unwillingly made a minister. I was a persecutor of the church, but I was made a minister. It's, it's written in the passive voice there. According to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the very working of his power, to me, the very least of all the saints. You see the humility there? I'm so undeserving. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. So he has a passion for preaching, a humility, and a passiveness in his proclamation. Verse 9, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. It's evident that the more you understand about God's grace and his goodness, the more compelled you are to tell others about it. When you are in a church family like this one, where you're continually reminded of the gospel, of the good news, and you walk out of here thinking, thank you, Lord, I am so undeserving, it naturally opens up your heart to be involved in missions. The church heartbeat is missions. Because you will naturally want to tell other people what you are going through, what you found. But if you're in a church that is not really deep, digging deep into the great riches of God's grace, not understanding his truths. Yeah, missions is going to be just something your church does over there. Not only do we have proclamation as a result of the mystery, but we have praise. And this is where it really starts to get amazing. Take a look at verses 10 and 11. And I said, start to get amazing. It's been amazing the whole time, but I don't know. I don't have other words to describe it. Just look at these verses. You know, angels and authorities, rulers and authorities are angels. So, so think of it in that context, okay? In, in, in Colossians 1, Ephesians 1, they're holy angels. In Ephesians 6, they're, they're fallen angels. I'm not sure which ones he's referring to here, rulers and authorities. But heavenly beings, whether they're fallen angels, I think primarily he's probably speaking here of holy angels. Verse 10, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church. This is the church. You see that church, the word church is there. This is where we get to the church. You say, well, it's not in the center of the passage. It is the heartbeat of this passage. Jews and Gentiles together, worshiping the Lord, the church, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, to angels. This was in accordance to the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. God never said, oh, man, I'll create a perfect garden, and oh, no, this didn't work out. What am I going to do now? Okay, well, let's try a sacrificial system. Ah, yeah, they kind of got, that's all gummed up now with their spiritual pride. Uh, uh, I guess I'm going to have to sacrifice my son. That's, how, that's the only way I can think of now to get out of this. His eternal purpose was the church. And it was for worship from angels. It must have been holy angels. We know that angels long, 1 Peter 1.12, they long to look into things that happen here with the church. And so, here's the picture. Almighty God, from eternity past, ordained that created angels who worship Him would watch Him create the world and all that's in it, and they would watch the world rebel against Him and shake their fists at Him and say, no, we will not worship you. We want to worship ourselves. And then you'll get the two people groups, that one that God loves and has made a light to the world, and the people that they hate the most, and the angels are watching this, and they're saying, oh yeah, that'll never work. And he reconciles them as one body. And angels say, holy, holy, holy. In God's wisdom, he can devise a way to take every wall that divides people from each other and focus on him. He's the great teacher. Praise causes us to shout out immortal, invisible, God only wise, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, 
thy great name we praise. Well, the mystery of Christ Jesus not only results in proclamation and praise, but we'll look at verses 12 and 13 together in prayer and peace, and these go together. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness and confident access through the Father in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulation on your behalf, for they are your glory. According to the Old Testament Jewish system, the only one among the nation of Israel who could go in the holy place was that high priest. It was only once a year, and as I said before, those walls are down, the, the veil is torn. Hebrews 4, verses 15 through 16 says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Paul encouraged them in verse 13 with these words, Don't lose heart because of my tribulations. Because Paul had access to, to the throne of grace, so he had peace. And they had access to the throne of grace, so they could have peace. And if God's wisdom can take a crucified Lord and bring glory out of that circumstance, then we can boldly become before him with any trial that we have and trust him to deal with it rightly. Ultimately, our desire is not the disappearance of the trials, it's the glory of God. As Romans 8.18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, which reminds us that one day we will be around the throne and, throne and we'll be saying, Glory, glory, glory. And the, the, that experience will be so beautiful and so we'll be so enthralled with His glory that none of us will ever say, I suppose this was worth it. <laughs> you know, I was pretty tough down there, but if I weigh it, yeah, this is better. I mean, it's worth it, all those trials. I wish I didn't have to go through them, but no, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Alive in Him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine, Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. This closing prayer goes through the rest of the chapter. I encourage you this afternoon, read verses 14 through 21. And don't miss verses 20 and 21, which I'm going to read now in closing. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory where? In the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Is the church central in missions? The church is the mystery of missions. Let's rejoice in that and let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time together in your word. Thank you for allowing us to look at a lengthy passage here and kind of get a feel for this, these chapters in Ephesians and help us, Father, to continually desire to bring more and more glory to your name, that each one of us would be so eager to be involved in the proclamation of your word in praise to you, in prayer, in peace, because those are the results of the mystery. The church, Jews and Gentiles, brought together a mystery that was revealed, a mystery that has been reconciled, a mystery that has beautiful results. And we're thankful, Father, that you have helped us to understand that, help us to live out our lives in a way that brings your name exaltation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.